I'm really happy to have Ashley Edwards, who was most recently a research scientist at DeepMind, where she uh, co-led work uh, called Genie, which uh, was super popular on Twitter. I think it's the first place I, I saw it. Um, but yeah, lots of exciting developments, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you for the introduction, for inviting me to be here, and thank you all for, um, for joining. Um, so yeah, I'm actually I'm really excited to be talking about our recent work, uh, Generative Interactive Environments, um, or, or Gini. Uh, so I decided today just to mainly focus on this work here rather than talking about uh, uh, my prior works, but I will give a little bit of a background. Uh, so in general, my research has been about how we can train agents to learn uh, from videos so learning things like actions and policies and reward functions. Um, so my background is in reinforcement learning. And during my PhD, I got kind of annoyed with having to come up with the reward functions and training data for training agents. So at some point, I was like, well, what if we can just show it a bunch of videos and then it can, can learn from those? Um, so after my PhD, I went off to Uber and I was looking into, again, how we can train agents to look from, learn from videos. And I went off to DeepMind, and I was, again, looking into how we can train agents to learn from videos. And I think I would have continued going along that trajectory of training agents to learn from videos. Um, but I was lucky to meet um, some folks that have backgrounds in uh, open-ended reinforcement learning. And they said, well, rather than looking at how we can train agents from these sort of pre-existing environments, what about we just go off and generate the environments ourselves? Uh, and so I think this helped me break out of the mold of training agents. And now we got into this sort of regime of, of training environments. Uh, so before getting started, I just wanted to point out that none of this work would have been possible without this amazing team shown here. Cool. Um, so it's kind of hard to believe that it's been over 10 years since DeepMind released its seminal paper on deep reinforcement learning. Uh, where they showed that you can train agents to learn how to solve Atari tasks, achieving a sort of superhuman performance in, in many of them. Um, and this was interesting back then, uh, because before this work came out, we often had to look into how we could sort of come up with the, our own training uh, features for training reinforcement learning agents. Uh, but what they showed in this work is that through the power of deep learning, uh, we could learn these features from pixels alone, rather than having to hand specify the features ourselves. Fast forward a few years later, uh, and now we have agents that are capable of uh, solving the game of Go. And if you're familiar, as you know, from Move 37, these agents were just only able to solve the problem that they are actually capable of surprising us. And I promise I didn't just throw this in here now. <laughs> I know Tori just spent some time with Nathan chatting about this work. Um, but the reason that I had actually put this in here is because through this work and the work on Atari, we start to see uh, sort of the foundations being laid for how we can train agents to learn uh, sort of superhuman performance, but in sort of narrow um, and specific environments. Uh, but in this day and age, I would say we're getting more and more interested in how we can actually train generalist agents that can learn not only from a single domain, but actually learn from anything that you can throw at it. Uh, so this was the idea behind this work uh, called GATO. So I, I was lucky to participate in this work, but at a very, very uh, a small capacity. But the main idea here was that we can train a generalist agent to not only learn to solve a single task over a single modality, but actually learn to solve uh, multiple tasks across multiple modalities, such as images and text and sequences of images and sequences of text. Uh, so this is just so showing the scale of some of the environments that this work was capable of solving. Um, and if, uh, at the time, compared to previous works, this was like quite a large scale for a reinforcement learning agent. Uh, but unfortunately, this video isn't going to expand forever. We're going to run out of, of training data for, for training generalist agents, uh, especially compared to the, the amount of data that we've seen for, for training more uh, generalist models that we've been seeing today. Uh, in particular, so in the past few years, we've seen things like text generation models going from a proof of concept to being put in the hands of millions of people. We're seeing the same sort of thing for uh, text to image models, text to video models, and now text to audio models. I think even just this week, there's been a new text to video model that's, um, that's doing really well. Um, and these works, uh, and I guess the power behind these works 
are largely uh, coming from the vast amount of data that they've been training in. And I think this is sort of a theme that we've been seeing throughout the day, that having more data ends up getting you these more and more um, general models. Uh, and so the question that I kind of wanted to consider today is how we can get this sort of scale for training generalists, reinforcement learning agents. Um, in particular, we're going to have to focus on getting the environments for training them in. Um, and so there's been a few different approaches that we've often taken in the field for getting more environments for training reinforcement learning agents. One is to come up with the environments ourselves. And again, this is going to have to, you're going to have to write the code and then come up with the, with the reward function and the actions and that sort of thing. Another is to take pre-existing environments. So things like Atari, um, in like the open AI gym and that sort of thing. Um, but the problem is it's not as like very easy to have to convert pre-existing environments into environments that we can use for training reinforcement learning um, uh, agents. And so I don't really think that these sorts of approaches are going to scale uh, and get us to the amount of data that we need for training generalist agents um, because they require a lot of uh, human labor uh, and if you're familiar with the bitter lesson from Rich Sutton, I also think that someone recently alluded to that. Um, but approaches that utilize scale, scaling in data, scaling in computes are going to be the approaches that in the end prevail. Um, so again, how can we actually start thinking about how we can get this sort of data for training reinforcement learning agents? Um, so yeah, the, the idea behind Genie is to start to consider how we can actually generate interactive environments uh, from videos alone, using all of the videos on the internet. And I think this is what's really going to enable us to get the amount of environments that we can train uh, generalist reinforcement learning agents from. But also, I think it open up, opens up a, a pretty big potential for, for applications. Uh, so we've seen a lot of advances these days in video, mo uh, in video generation models. Um, but these, uh, these models aren't really environments. Uh, so you can't actually interact with them on a fine grained level. Um, so I wouldn't consider these to be world models, uh, even if some claim that they are. <laughs> um, so I think the problem is, so you could try to do something like, given some text, maybe I can say, okay, I'm going, I want my model to move to the left, move to the right. But the problem is that you don't really have that kind of training data. So in order to get that, you're going to need a bunch of videos paired with captions, that say at this step, this is the action that was taking place and then you're going to need to train a model, um, which I think is going to be very difficult to sort of obtain that kind of data. On the other hand, we have world models. So world models where you can take, a, in, in a given state, you can take an action, you get another state. Um, and these do give you that sort of controllability. I mean, these can be considered environments, I would say, uh, but they often require you to have uh, videos, paired with actions or environments paired with actions, um, which again, is going to be difficult to scale. As I mentioned before, we don't have that many environments for training generalist agents. Uh, so the idea behind Genie was essentially to try to work as a video model. So we're going to train to generate next frames given videos, but we want to do this in a controllable manner so that we can actually interact with the environments that we're generating. So this was essentially our mission to learn a generative interactive environment from videos um, playable by both humans and AI agents. And you might be wondering where humans have come, come from. I've been talking a lot about agents so far. Um, well, at some point we realized that these environments were actually quite fun for us to interact with ourselves. Um, but also, I guess the idea is that if we can ourselves interact with the environments, then hopefully we can give them to agents and they'll be able to interact with them too. Um, so anyways, the videos that we're, uh, that we're going to train over, we're going to train over a large amount of videos from the internet. The idea behind Genie is to be able to learn from these such that given a single image, rather than predict a single frame uh, like you would see in a video model, we want to be able to condition on an action and predict all of the next possible frames uh, given that action in previous frame. So this is going to, again, start acting like what you would see in a world model uh, with the caveat that our actions are actually not going to, going to be given to us, but we're going to learn them in a completely unsupervised manner uh, from videos alone. So let's just jump into some of the architecture details here. Uh, so Genie essentially consists of three different components. One is going to be a tokenizer, which we use to represent our frames of images. One is going to be 
a latent action model, which we're going to be using to infer actions from videos, again, in an unsupervised manner without any action labels. Um, and then our dynamics model, which is going to be our world model that'll take in frames, latent actions, predict the next frame. Um, and I'll, I'll go into all of these uh, in detail next. So the first thing that we have is our video tokenizer. Uh, so this is essentially based on a vector quantized or VQ VIE model. If you're unfamiliar with this work, it essentially tries to learn an embedding um, such that it, you can compute also a, a code book of embeddings and you're going to try to find your nearest neighbor to those. The reason that I'm saying this is just to say that we're going to try to learn a discrete version of this. So we can say, okay, at index zero, that's the closest nearest neighbor to my embedding. So my, my discrete version is going to be zero. Um, and that code book is also going to be, be learned. Uh, so our frames are going to be represent, represented by this tokenizer. What we're going to do is we're going to embed them um, into these discrete tokens, and then we're going to just reconstruct the same sort of image that we've taken in. Um, and then we can have just like a mean squared error loss on, on, that, uh, on that generated frame. The next thing that we're going to learn is a latent action model. And I think this is kind of one of the most, I guess, fun parts of Genie was trying to, to learn this. And so what we're going to do again is try to learn a representation um, over our frames that let us represent actions, but going, it's going to be in a completely unsupervised manner. Um, and so it's easy to think about this in terms of two frames, although we can have, I guess, a sequence of frames. But the idea is given a, a single frame and your next frame, what we're going to do is we're going to compress these into a single embedding. And again, we're going to use this VQ model because we want these things to be discrete so that we can actually uh, interact with our model. Um, so yeah, we're going to use a VQ model. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that latent action, plug it into uh, our forward dynamics model, our world model. So given your frame, latent action, <laughs> predict the next frame. But the main idea here is that our latent action gets to see both the past and the future and so what it's going to try to do is it's going to try to compress that representation such that we can predict the future given only the past. Um, and this is what's going to give us controllability. And so the final component here is going to be our dynamics model. Um, actually, I'll go back real quick because I wanted to talk about the decoder here. Um, so this decoder, we're not actually using for the world model. It's actually pretty crappy, um, but we trained that basically using a mean squared error loss. Uh, and because we're doing that, it's going to basically be pretty blurry. The only reason we use that decoder is for actually training our latent actions. Um, and so the dynamics model, which I'm going to talk about next, is how we're actually going to interact with the world. Okay, so going back, <laughs> the main idea behind the dynamics model is to take your history of frames, the latent actions that I was talking about before and predict the future. Um, so our frames are going to be tokenized using the VQ model that I mentioned before. Um, the latent actions are going to be coming from the previous model. We're going to plug this into uh, something called a mask get decoder. The main idea here is then rather than predicting a single token at a time, we're going to try to predict our tokens in parallel, which is going to significantly speed up inference. Um, and because we actually want to interact with these models, we want inference to actually be pretty fast. Um, so we're going to be predicting next, uh, next frame tokens. Um, and this is basically what we get uh, for Genie. This is going to be our world model where we can take in our frames, take in some latent actions and interact with this um, so that we can generate new environments. Um, also, one other thing with that is that we're going to train it using a cross entropy loss. So the dynamics model, the dynamics that we're generating are going to be much more crisp than what we were doing with the mean squared error because we're predicting tokens. Um, one final thing about the architecture. Um, so essentially, uh, I haven't actually mentioned the word transformer yet, I don't think, but we use it basically within every single component of our model. So within the tokenizer, within the latent action model, within the dynamics model, uh, we're going to use something called a spatial temporal transformer. Um, which is going to have a spatial layer for your images, um, a temporal layer for time, because we're, we're learning over sequences of images, which is a video, um, and, then, and then a linear layer. Um, but the way that we've structured it is, is, is such that we can scale the model um, linearly rather than uh, quadratically over time. So again, this is going to give us a bit of a speed up and also helps with memory. Um, we talk a lot more about this in the paper if you want to take a look. Uh, so, okay, I said I was done with architecture, but this 
you don't have to think too much about the architecture. The main idea is how we can actually interact with this model during inference time. So what we can do is we take in our frame, take in a latent action, generate the next frame. And again, this is going to enable us to interact with the model as if it were a world model. And because we are learning discrete latent actions, um, as I mentioned before, this enables people to just say, I wanna take latent action zero, and that's gonna move the world in this way. I'll take latent action one, and it's gonna move the, the world in this way. Uh, one thing we actually noticed very early on is that it's very important for us to jump in and interact with these models ourselves rather than having them run off in the background. Um, one reason for this is it's actually quite difficult to measure, uh, uh, evaluate our models quantitatively. Like we could say, okay, the, the generated videos uh, do well on this metric, but it tells us nothing about how controllable they are and, and how um, consistent the latent actions that we're learning are. Uh, so we basically, every month we would get together and try to solve something we called the genie bottle challenge, where we would take a text generated model and say, I'm gonna generate an image of a character that needs to reach a genie lamp. Um, and then we plug this into genie and then we basically play the environment as if it were a game and try to see if we could actually reach the bottle. <laughs> um, so this was really great because we started to see over time, like initially the results were really bad, <laughs> um, but slowly you start to see like, oh wow, we're getting better and better at actually controlling the model. Like the latent actions are becoming even more consistent. Um, it turns out that actually was due a lot to scale. <laughs> um, but yeah, it ended up working out quite, quite well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show, I guess, some, um, oh, it skips. Oh, they're in the wrong order. Okay, well, this is the order I wanna show you in. <laughs> um, so these are showing initial prompt images. And basically what I want to show is what it looks like to interact with the model. And so I'm going to show like real human interaction. Um, so these are all the same prompt images shown here, going backwards. <laughs> um, and now we see like different trajectories being generated. Um, based on how we're interacting with the model. So again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, given this frame, take this latent action, uh, it's gonna generate a completely different frame and you see completely different and diverse trajectories happening here. Um, and again, we didn't train with really any, uh, any real actions. It was all learned in a completely unsupervised manner, but we're able to get this sort of control. Um, just a, a few more details. So we actually trained the model on 30,000 hours of uh, publicly available internet gameplay <laughs> consisting of hundreds of, of 2D platformer games. And so this is showing results from an 11 billion parameter uh, model. And what we can essentially see is these were actually all text generated images. So given these sort of images, we're actually able to step in them and bring them to life. Um, this is just showing some more examples, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so again, we can basically take text generated images and interact with the model as if it were a real game. Uh, and so if you think back to the sort of um, video I showed before with the scale of reinforcement learning environments that were used to train um, Gateau, you can imagine that now we can sort of expand this out until you know, we run out of time or compute <laughs> and have an unlimited set of training our environments over. Um, at some point, we also realized that we can basically plug in really out of distribution um, images into our model and interact with those as well. So not just text generated images, um, but this is actually so Richie from our team drew that and Jeff Kloon, who's on the team, his children made this and then I drew this one, but don't judge me too much. <laughs> um, but the main idea is we can basically take these worlds that someone created right in front of them and again, we're able to bring them to life. Um, so you see here, this character is able to climb this ladder that someone drew. Um, and this little football player is scrolling to the side. And my little blob of a character thingy here is able to jump on the platforms and actually like do things, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I think results like this is what really kind of showed us that uh, we can really enable creativity. Um, and so what else can we use Genie for? <laughs> um, well, this is another example. <laughs> so we also took real world images. And again, we only trained on videos of 2D platformer games. So we didn't train over any, um, any real world images. But we were also able to take uh, photos. So this is Jack's dog, Doris, and Tim's like figurine here, or my slice of pizza. And we're able to kind of control these things too. Um, like imagine if we had actually trained on this kind of data. 
Uh, so one other important thing to point out is that we weren't only interested in how we can use latent actions to control our models, um, but we also had to control them in a consistent manner. And what I mean is we always wanted latent action zero to maybe move to the right and latent action one to move to the left of that sort of thing. We didn't actually have anything in the model that enabled that other than compressing the future in the past such that you can use that for predicting the future given the past. Um, which is our latent action. Uh, so you can see here, if you look at uh, these different initial um, prompt images, if we plug in the same sequence of latent actions, we're starting to see the same trajectory happen. So I don't actually think we have the, the trajectory that we have, but let's say it was like at latent action zero, five, seven, six, whatever. If we plug these all into the same prompt image, you get the same sort of motion, which is kind of telling us that we are getting these consistent uh, latent actions being learned. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's quite hard to actually measure this quantitatively. So we kind of just have these sort of visuals and then us interacting with the model. Um, and so we're able to learn this again in a completely unsupervised manner without actually having to do anything like object detection or using ground truth action labels or anything like that. Um, so I think this was, this was one of the, I guess, most exciting things that we, we were able to find with the project. Uh, we are also able to get motion parallax for free again by plugging in the same sequence of latent actions. And so this is the sort of phenomenon when, like when we're in motion, objects that are closer to us tend to look like they're moving faster than objects that are, that are further away. Um, this is a sort of cue that game developers often uh, put into their games to simulate depth. Um, but you see that our model is able to, to learn this sort of thing. You can also see it here. Uh, so basically this is just showing, given uh, different objects, how far do these get uh, displaced uh, when we generate the next frame? Uh, and you can see here that, again, objects that are close tend to move more uh, or are displaced more than objects that are further away. And the reason I'm pointing this out um, is just to show that our model was able to actually learn these sorts of nuances of the environments that it was training on. Um, but it's not all fun and games. Uh, Genie also works over real world data as well. So this is showing. Uh, robotics data that we also trained on using a completely different model. So we weren't using the same parameters from our, from our plat, platformer data set. Um, but instead, this is using RT1 and QTOP, if you're familiar with that. Again, we're going to strip out action. So we're only learning to generate the next frames. Um, and again, you can kind of see that we're given the same sequence of latent actions and different prompt frames, we're getting similar trajectories happening. We're also able to simulate deformable objects. Um, and so we basically only took the same hyperparameters we had learned in the previous model and just plugged in a new data set and saw what happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see what this looked like if we had tuned it or like if we plugged in a completely different data set. So as I mentioned before, my background's in reinforcement learning and I've been doing imitation from uh, our training agents from videos and that sort of thing. And I said I'd moved on from that, but I couldn't help myself and I ended up doing it still. <laughs> um, but again, as I mentioned before, we really wanted to use Genie uh, as an environment for, for training generalist agents. There's a lot we actually really need to figure out before we can to get, get to that point, such as where does the reward come from and that sort of thing, and also inference speed, it's kind of slow to run things. Um, so we didn't quite use it as an environment yet, but what we could do is we could take latent actions, learned from videos on the internet, use those to label a sequence of, of observations or a video that we hadn't seen before, and train an agent to imitate that. Um, so if you're familiar with VPT, it's doing something similar, except we're using latent actions instead of real actions here. Um, but the main idea is we can use those uh, video latent actions and use them for uh, training agents in environments that we had never seen before. So we behavioral cloned here um, and we're able to get pretty good performance. One other final, like not surprising thing, I guess, is that scale helps. <laughs> um, so we noticed that as we scaled the model, as we scaled the bat size, the loss decreased performance improved. Uh, and so this is what ended up leading us to our final 11 billion parameter model with like a bat size of 512. But we also realize not everyone has access to this sort of compute. So we also uh, have uh, this reproducible um, coin run, which is like a reinforcement learning environment example in the paper, which you can basically train in like a week with a single mid range TPU. Uh, and so basically, if you try to reproduce this, you'll start to see these consistent latent actions. So each of these rows 
corresponds to one of the latent actions that was learned by the model. And so you can see like latent action five just like moves to the left, latent action zero stays still. Um, and so if you wanted to try to reproduce that, you might want to see something like that. Always happy to chat if anyone wanted to try this themselves. I, I'm hoping that, that we made it in such a way that it will be easy to, to reproduce. Cool. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, as we've discussed, I really think that we're going to have to vastly scale up our environments in order to train uh, generalist agents. I, I think gening gets us closer to that sort of training regime. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of different directions that we can take. Like this is only focusing on this data set, but I think there's a lot of different kinds of data sets we, that we can train our models on. We haven't tried training reinforcement learning agents in the environment. I think that's another exciting direction. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I've got for now. But yeah, if you have questions, please let me know. Thanks for your time. Thank you.